The next item of business is topical questions and uh, any member who would wish to seek to request a supplementary question should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letters RTS. And again, I would make a plea, as always, for succinct questions and answers to match. I call question number one, Sandish Gohani. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on Strep A cases in Scotland, including what it is doing to mitigate any risks. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. A number of children from England and Wales have sadly died from invasive Group A strep infection since September. My deepest condolences go out to their families during this uh, unimaginably difficult time. Uh, reports of Group A strep infections, or, or gas as it's known, have increased right across Scotland. There have been no reported deaths in Scotland related to uh, Group A strep or indeed invasive uh, Group A strep conditions. I understand, of course, uh, that the, the reporting of uh, gas conditions uh, will be concerning. And let me offer some reassurance. The vast majority of gas infections present as mild illnesses, uh, mild illness that is easily treated, treated by penicillin or indeed other antibiotics. Uh, invasive infections are thankfully very rare. Uh, peaks in gas infections are expected during winter and spring, typically with spikes every three or four years. Uh, current numbers do not significantly exceed previous spikes. Uh, nonetheless, of course, we are not complacent. Health services right across Scotland are on alert. They will act swiftly to identify and treat gas infection. Uh, guidance has been prepared for nurseries and schools, especially around maintaining good hygiene and managing outbreaks. And everyone should self-isolate until they have completed 24 hours of antibiotics. I will update further if needed, but I stress again that the vast majority of cases are thankfully mild and easily treatable. Sanjish Gohani. Symptoms for strep A uh, include a sandpaper-like rash, flu symptoms, so temperature over 38, sore throat, swollen glands, a strawberry red-looking tongue. Uh, I would urge people who have symptoms like this, especially in those children around under 10, to speak to their GP because antibiotics can very much help uh, in these cases. Yesterday, in the House of Lords, the option of using antibiotics in schools as a preventative measure uh, was raised when cases were present in that school. Are the Scottish Government actively considering prophylaxis? Cabinet Secretary. So again, I've asked uh, Public Health Scotland and my clinical uh, colleagues to give advice to that effect. Uh, what I would say is the levels of gas infection that we're seeing, and again, thankfully, uh, of, of, of Group A strep that is not invasive, uh, they are, those cases are mild. Uh, we have seen, uh, of course, uh, the levels we've seen have not been uh, or exceeded the peak levels that we've seen in previous years. Uh, thankfully, we've not seen uh, any deaths so far uh, in Scotland, but we're not complacent. We do expect cases to rise over the coming weeks, and hence why I've asked clinicians to give advice about the very issue that Sandish Gohani uh, has raised. Sandish Gohani. I've spoken to multiple patients in my GP surgery who are concerned about strep A and their children's health, and those concerns are only exacerbated when parents know that if their child does get sick, they will struggle to get an appointment with their GP, spend hours waiting for NHS 24, many hanging up with frustration or spending even longer in an A&E waiting room. Cabinet Secretary, today we saw the worst ever A&E waiting times, with one in 20 over 12 hours of waiting. Can the Cabinet Secretary promise patients they won't be spending 12 hours plus in an A&E waiting room this Christmas? So, what I would say to Sanders Gohani is that uh, Public Health Scotland have issued an alert to healthcare services in Scotland, of course, including clinicians and those in primary uh, care, to be aware of the increase in incidence and potential severity of Group A strep infections and its complications. That also includes recommendations from primary care, uh, for primary, primary care clinicians to take a, a, a low threshold to prescribing antibiotics, um, as penicillin is, is the first-line therapy, to children that are presenting with features of gas infection. I saw some media reports uh, around potential shortages uh, in other parts of the UK in relation to amoxicillin. I've checked uh, with my uh, clinicians uh, and indeed with the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, uh, and she advises there are no shortages uh, of penicillin. So, yes, I'm confident that if people, uh, parents in particular, uh, raise the uh, cases with their GP, that they will be seen and given, be given the appropriate treatment. Supplementary, Jackie Bailey. 
Glasgow's Royal Hospital for Children warned parents about attendance at a and &E a couple of weeks ago. This morning's statistics reveal, as we've already heard, our emergency departments are under incredible pressure. So can the Cabinet Secretary explain what additional capacity and guidance has been provided to health boards to ensure that children taking unwell can be seen without any delay? Yeah, I think a very important question from Jackie Bailey uh, indeed and first and foremost uh, as well as strep A we are seeing other respiratory viruses in children that have seen the increase in attendances at children's hospitals uh, and that is borne out Jackie Bailey is right to mention uh, borne out in the statistics uh, that have been uh, released uh, today uh, so uh, we have uh, made sure that we are as I've, I've already referenced in my uh, answer to, to, to Sanders Gohani uh, ensuring that all our health care services NHS 24 told me, for example, over the course of the weekend, they saw a marked and significant increase in calls about children under the age of 14. So all of our health care services right across the board are being given the appropriate advice in terms of uh, what they can tell parents, uh, the advice that they can give to parents and those that call in with concerns about strep A. Uh, but that is not just NHS 24, it's right across the board, of course, including to our uh, 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 accident emergency services. What I would say uh, is, of course, is, uh, if, if you want more information, need more information about strep A, have a concern, uh, the signs and symptoms, that, that information is available uh, online. Uh, it would, of course, go to your primary care clinician, your GP first and foremost, and they should be able to treat that uh, condition uh, with antibiotics. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that local government directors of finance have written to the Finance Secretary regarding an unprecedented £1 billion budget gap and of COSLA stating that the current spending plans will lead to job losses. Deputy First Minister John Swinney. President Officer, the autumn statement did not do enough to support devolved budgets to address the 41-year high inflationary pressures that are impacting Scotland's families, businesses and public services. I have already taken the unprecedented step of making an emergency budget statement to Parliament to reprioritise over £1.2 billion of expenditure. Whilst most portfolios were required to make savings in that exercise, Ministers took a conscious decision to protect local government and the funding available to councils actually increased. Despite that, Parliament should be under no illusion that we are facing the most challenging budget circumstances since devolution. I will set out the financial support to local government in the Scottish Government's budget next Thursday. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, right now, across local government, 6,000 jobs are at risk amidst the cost of living crisis. Earlier today, in my region, Falkirk Council's executive was asked to agree to sell off 131 public buildings, swimming pools, Grangemouth Stadium, sports halls, gyms, village and community halls and park buildings, all sold to fill their deficit and with it 200 jobs. Now, given the scale of the crisis engulfing local government, does the Cabinet Secretary um, acknowledge the seriousness of COSLA's calls and will he commit today to look again at the current spending plans for local government? Deputy First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I, I do recognise the gravity of the financial challenge. Uh, it's, I'm faced by that every day in what I'm wrestling with in the Scottish Government's budget just now in dealing with the profound implications of inflation, public sector pay and energy costs. And these will be felt by public bodies the length and breadth of the country. Um, I met with COSLA leaders uh, last week, I think on Friday of last week, to uh, hear their views on the, on, on the Scottish Government's budget. Um, my officials have followed up that discussion on Friday with supplementary discussions. And as I indicated in my earlier answer, I will set out the financial support to local government in the Scottish Government budget next week. Mark Griffin. I look forward to, to seeing that set out. But, you know, President Officer, this isn't politicians that are flagging this financial black hole. It's directors of finance who are saying that they're £1 billion short. It's an SNP COSLA president who's told us that the Scottish Government's spending plans, as they stand, will see council services either significantly <coughs> reduced, cut or, or stopped altogether. It's the COSLA SNP resources spokesperson who's talked about councils stopping the preventative spending, which will end up costing the NHS significantly more money. The directors of finance have asked that the shackles of ring fencing are, are removed. Will the Cabinet Secretary uh, agree to this and ensure that local government have the fullest flexibility to cope with this cost of living crisis? Deputy First Minister. 
As Mr Griffin will know from the steps I took in 2007 when I set my first budget out to Parliament that I took decisive action to reduce ring fencing back in 2007. And I acknowledge that ring fencing has come back into a number of different areas, but that is largely to assure government and actually Parliament as well that expenditure decided in Parliament is being deployed by local authorities on particular policy priorities, no more so than on the challenges that we face in relation to social care, where the government is allocating substantial additional revenue, but we see delayed discharges at their highest level within our hospitals today, which is about uh, the issues within the social care system. So there are tough issues to be wrestled with here. Mr Griffin cited the letter from the Directors of Finance and one of the, uh, in relation to the point on ring fencing. One of the other points that the Directors of Finance made to me, and this is part of the dilemma we all face, the Directors of Finance said that the Barnet consequentials from the UK Government are targeted to support the vital services that local government provide. That would mean, if I followed that, that would mean there wouldn't be any extra money given to the health service. And I don't for a minute believe that's Mr Griffin's position. And it's, I've got to take a balanced position. Um, so I can't do everything that's asked of me in this letter because it would be impractical to do so. It would starve the health service of resources. And I don't think anyone in Parliament wants that to be the case. Supplementary, Mars Briggs. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The local government core settlement has seen a real terms reduction of 15.2% since 2013-14, with COSLA noting in March that increasingly directed funding and pressure on core budgets mean councils have limited flexibility. Council leaders are saying that there is nothing else to cut, and we also know now that the National Care Service is going to destabilise the planning and delivery of services within local government. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, is he looking at pausing the National Care Service, given all these pressures which local government are facing and the disruption it will bring? Deputy First Minister. For all the reasons that I set out in my earlier answer, my last supplementary answer to Mr Griffin, the National Care Service is an important reform to ensure that we can make progress on addressing the challenges, which I think all parties are agreed on, about the delivery of social care within Scotland. So the Government will take forward these um, proposals. They are the subject of consultation and dialogue. We are listening very carefully to what parliamentary committees say in relation to the National Care Service, and uh, we will we'll, we'll take forward the steps the Government has already announced. A supplementary, Paul McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. I understand that the Director of Finance and Local Government have written to Scottish Ministers calling for financial sustainability for local authorities. Would the Deputy First Minister agree financial sustainability would be helpful for our councils and essential services we provide to people and communities? Deputy First Minister. Y yes, I do um, agree with that point. You know, the Government has um, a increased local authority funding to the tune of 23% uh, uh, since 2013-14. Um, we have treated local authorities fairly. Uh, there is a real terms increase in local authority funding of 6% um, in the budgets from last year into this. So um, we do all we can within the resources available to us to ensure that local government is properly funded. Uh, thank you. And I now call question number three, Myrtle Fraser. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what is its response to comments from the Auditor General that it underspent its budget by £2 billion in the financial year 2021-22. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, the Scottish Government annual accounts provide explanations of all significant variances in the portfolio outturn statements and make clear that the underspend reported does not represent a loss of spending power. The underspend includes over £900 million of non-cash and ring fence budgets, is before allowing late funding adjustments of over £500 million, and makes use of the limited carry forward in the Scotland Reserve. The Scottish Government has reported transparently on the carry-forward position at the provisional outturn and will confirm the final outturn position to Parliament shortly. All funding is fully utilised in supporting the 2022-23 budget. Myrtle Fraser. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. This Scottish Government is always telling us it does not have enough money to spend, despite the fact that we know that in the current financial year it has the highest budget ever in the history of devolution. And now we know, of course, from the Auditor General that it underspent last year's budget by £2 billion. So, so what is the carry forward to this year's budget from that uh, underspend? And how much of that money that was not uh, spent last year represents funds that came from the UK Government for COVID support, which was not spent uh, on COVID support, but was siphoned off elsewhere. Deputy First Minister. Uh, 
first of all, can I just make clear to Mr Fraser, and, and I thought my original answer had done so, but uh, I'll, I'll say it again, just to try to make sure that I can make an impact on his presentation of all of this. Um, but £900 million of the underspend reported by the Auditor General relates to non-cash and ring fence budgets that the Government cannot spend on other items. It's in relation to annually managed expenditure, which is the control of the UK Government, and uh, student loan support, which can only be used for student loan support on a demand basis, and we can't redirect it to anywhere else. So these are basic points, really, really, really basic points about the public finances that I would have thought Mr Fraser might have understood the length of time he's been in this institution. Now, we, um, we assumed when the budget was passed in the spring of a £450 million carried forward into this financial year. Uh, that had risen to £550 million by March. And I assure Mr Fraser that uh, the underspend reported does not represent a loss of spending power in any respect by the Scottish Government. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I noticed the Deputy First Minister did not address the question of COVID support funds being siphoned off elsewhere. Uh, but last week, the Auditor General also called for greater financial transparency from the Scottish Government and for them to fulfil their commitment to produce a consolidated account for the whole public sector in Scotland. Will the Scottish Government be fulfilling that commitment? And if so, when? Deputy First Minister. In relation to the uh, issue on COVID spending, the Government has spent uh, in excess of the COVID consequentials that have been allocated to us. One of the comments of the Auditor General that Mr Fraser did not cite was this comment from the Auditor General, and I quote, my independent opinion is unqualified. This means, in my opinion, I am content the Scottish Government consolidated accounts show a true and fair view following accounting standards and that the income and expenditure for the year is lawful. I would have thought that would have been quite a reassurance to Mr Fraser as a, a, as a law-abiding citizen of the confidence that not for the first time the Government's accounts have attracted an unqualified opinion. We have an unqualified opinion for our accounts for every single year the SNP Government has been in office. That is a source of great reassurance to Mr Fraser. And in relation to the point on uh, transparency, uh, the Auditor General also said that the Government has continued to strengthen aspects of its governance arrangements during 2021-22 and we will, of course, consider all the recommendations from the Auditor General as we take forward our accounting practices. A supplementary, Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The two richest families in Scotland have more wealth than the poorest 20 per cent of the country. The Scottish Government often says that it has a fixed budget, but has the Cabinet Secretary had the opportunity to consider the STUC report published this week, options for increasing taxes in Scotland to fund investment in public services, which outlines short-term measures which could be taken to raise over £1 billion and longer-term measures which could be taken to raise many more billions of pounds for public services. Deputy First Minister. I, I, I am familiar with that report and I am considering it as I come to take the final decisions in relation to tax choices that the Government will make and set out to Parliament next Thursday. I should make it clear to Katie Clark that in this financial year the Government's budget is fixed. Once we set our tax rates, they cannot be revisited during a financial year. And unless there are consequential uh, decisions taken by the UK Government during a financial year, our budget is locked in, which is the difficulty I'm wrestling with in relation to finding adequate resources to fund the pay claims that we are facing during this financial year. So there is a very hard limit on the money available. This year, Katie Clark raises a completely set of legitimate issues about future tax choices. But for this financial year, the budget is fixed. A supplementary bill, kid. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, Deputy First Minister, this has been a turbulent year, not least thanks to the economic mismanagement of Murder Fraser's chums at Westminster. Ah. So it's welcome that the Scottish Government has delivered on the requirement for a balanced budget. Can the Deputy First Minister advise whether additional fis 
fiscal flexibilities would have enabled the Scottish Government to even better respond to the pressures which households and businesses across Scotland are facing as, facing as a result of the rising costs. Yeah, yeah. First Minister. President, so Mr Kidd raises a topical point in relation to the mismanagement of the public finances. Because at the Finance Committee this morning, the Chair of the Office for Budget Responsibility revealed that there would be an extra £40 billion worth in debt due to the fiscal mismanagement of the Conservative Government during the course of the last few weeks. £40 billion by 27-28, with which we will all be saddled. Now, there is no escaping the financial implications of that for us and for our citizens, and the Government's budget will be constructed to try to address those issues. Um, and Mr Kidd can be assured that the Government is giving every attention to the challenges that he raises in his question, and we will do all that we possibly can to address the cost of living challenges that are faced by members of the public, the length and breadth of our country. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. That concludes topical questions. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7093 in the name of Mary McCallan on COP27 outcomes. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson to speak to and to move the motion around 13 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Today's debate addresses one of the most important challenges facing not just Scotland, but the international community. The latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change painted a stark picture about the damage human beings are causing to the planet. They stated that climate change is already causing widespread disruption in every region in the world. The 1.1 degrees centigrade of warming is resulting in droughts, extreme heat and record floods. There are estimates that in the next decade, climate change will 